Well, praise the Lord, church. This past Tuesday, matter of fact, during the Parent Church Bible study, I text Sister Minor and Sister Brown. I'm glad Sister Brown isn't here because she'll be mad at me. Um, she's changing her, her robe. I texted her and said, text him and said, we have to minister, Mary, did you know, as the hymn of preparation. So they text back and said, oh, she can hear me now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ooh. I forgot we had speakers out in the vestibule. <laughs> Duh. And so she said, um, they said, okay, we'll do that. So then on Thursday, as I'm preparing for the message, I said, no, we need to sing Emmanuel at the beginning, then Lamb of God as the invocational prayer, and also, you know, Mary, did you know? And I didn't get into me text messages back after that. And so I got, a, I think, a side-eye text. I said, we'll do whatever you ask us to do, Pastor. And so then I saw Tiffany, Sister Brown's daughter, this morning. I went to give her a hug to say thank you. She's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Literally, that's exactly what she did. Because I saw Sister Brown yesterday at New Members Orientation. She said, here comes Tiffany now. Yes, I'm, talk I'm talking about all of y'all. She said, yeah, I didn't, get all this, I didn't get all these messages until Friday night. And I said, well, I texted you on Tuesday. We talked about it on Thursday, but Kelly didn't actually talk to you again on Friday. I don't know what, I don't know what she was doing. So. But no, I wanted to thank you personally that, you know, God speaks to my heart. Actually, he starts speaking to my heart a week in advance or sometimes weeks in advance for a service. And sometimes it could be hours or days in advance. And he'll guide me as to where we want to go. In today's service, I wanted to be different, and I wanted us to focus on some things that we don't typically focus on at this time of the year. And so I really appreciate the heart of our music ministry and our media tech ministry for putting up with their pastor. So I appreciate you all so much. So let's pray and hear from the Lord. Amen? Father, we come today. Yes, we came for fellowship. Yes, we came to praise and worship you, but Father, we also came to hear from you. There are questions on our heart. There are situations in our life. There are things occurring that we know not of, and we need your help right now, Father. So Father, as the speaker of the hour, I'm going to decrease and allow your true teacher and preacher to rise bold in me, your Holy Spirit, to teach and preach what's on your heart and what's on your mind. And I pray, Father, that we would take the time to listen. If you're taking the time to speak, let us take the time to listen, to receive and grow thereby. We love you, Father, and we praise you, Father. It's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray and give thanks. Amen. With our Bibles turned to Philippians chapter 2, we want to continue in our teaching series entitled, Think Like Jesus. Church, to have a mind to work, we must think like Jesus. And the statement that's been guiding us for these past three weeks is to think like Jesus, we must have his mind. To think like Jesus, we must have his mind. And I'm going to read in Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse number 5. The Word of God says here, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, what did he do, church? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Listen to the intent, purpose, and goal differently today, church. To think like Jesus, we must choose to think like Jesus. In order to think like Jesus, we must choose to think like Jesus. Thinking like Jesus is a choice. To think like Jesus, we must be reminded that we can think like Jesus. See, first we have to choose to think like him. And then we have to know that we can think like Jesus. And then, church, to think like Jesus, we must be one 
with the Father. We must be one with God. In the first week, we said to think like Jesus, we must glorify God. That was real simple. Glorify him. And how do we glorify him? We make of ourselves no reputation. We make ourselves to be made empty, to be made void, and to be made of none effect. We have to make of ourselves no reputation. Church, we have no reputation. I don't care if you're the most praised celebrity on the face of the earth. You have no reputation. Last week, we said that to think like Jesus, we must become a servant. And church, I said that Jesus sovereignly, deliberately, and lovingly chose to come to earth as a servant. Jesus sovereignly, he deliberately, and lovingly chose to come to earth as a servant. Last week, I said slave. That's what that word servant means. It means slave. See, Jesus recognized that he was a servant of servants, and he came to the earth to serve and not be served. In church, Jesus was not a servant in name only. Jesus actively served, and we use the historical account of him washing his disciples' feet as the many ways in which he served. We said last week, church, to become a servant, there were three things we had to do. We had to change our mindset about serving. We have to change our mind about serving. See, serving edifies us. We feel better when we serve. See, Sister Brown and Sister Brown, Renee and Tiffany, see, y'all feel better after serving. Maybe. Thank you again. But see, church, also to become a servant, we must look unto Jesus. See, this, this message could be look unto Jesus. Because in order to think like Jesus, you have to look unto him. But to look unto Jesus, we must follow Jesus' example in every aspect of our lives. There isn't any area in our lives that Jesus can't be touched with the infirmities of our lives. He was all points tempted, but he did not sin. And thirdly, church, to become a servant, we must seek to please God and not man. We must seek to please God and not man. And I'm going to say it differently than I did last week. We must be okay with the audience of one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Last week I said the Father of three and one. So it's the audience of one. This happened to manifest themselves in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. See, church, when we serve the Lord with gladness, he will reveal our heart to man. We serve him with gladness. God will reveal our heart to man. So you don't have to worry about showing your boss you're the best employee or whatever you may be. If you just serve God, he will reveal to the appropriate people. To my students out there, you don't have to be the teacher's pet. Be God's pet. And I promise you, he'll position you to do whatever needs to be done for you to be acclimated and to accelerate through school. I promise you on that. So here's some new information. You can subtitle today's message, To Think Like Jesus, We Must Humble Ourselves. To Think Like Jesus, We Must Humble Ourselves. Back in 2nd, I'm sorry, 1st Corinthians, or Corinthians chapter 2, excuse me, on verse 8 it says, And being found in fashion as a man, Jesus humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself. So if we can think like Jesus and have his mind, that, we can be, that means we can be humble as well. Hmm. See, church, here's the question. How do we humble ourselves? How do we humble ourselves? And guess what? The answer is right above verse 5 in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 3 and four is right there before us. To humble ourselves, look what it says here in verse three and four. 
let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Church, there are four ways in which we can humble ourselves. The first way, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. You know what strife and vainglory mean? It means contention. I like this one. Empty glorying. And it means self-conceit. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. Strife and vainglory mean contention, empty glory, and self-conceit. And it took me a while to figure out how to present that. But you know what it means to be, to not have nothing done with strife and vainglory, no contention, no empty glory and self-conceit? Listen to this carefully. Do not measure someone else's success by your ruler. Typically, you hear me say it this way, don't measure your success by somebody else's ruler, but I'm going to flip it today. Don't measure someone else's success by your ruler. And I tell myself all the time, and I don't mind, from past or present experiences, but as you all know, I was an only child, very spoiled, I admit that wholeheartedly, um, rotten to the core. And, you know, I thought like a child. And so my father, as many of you all know, drove a taxi cab. You ready for this? I thought that was beneath me. I'm a child who's being supported by a man who happened to have two jobs, and I thought that was beneath me. And I was ashamed of my father driving a taxi cab because he drove it everywhere. You go see grandmama in North Carolina, he drove the taxi cab down there. I don't think he's supposed to take it out of the jurisdiction, but you know, you know, whatever. That ain't my, that ain't my, my job. If we had to go to the movies, he drove the taxi cab. Now my mother drove Cadillacs, you know, as I like, you know. But anytime I had to, you know, he'd run me on errands, he would take his cab and not her Cadillac. And I love being in the Cadillac. Now, I didn't buy any one of these cars, but I thought that him having a job of a taxi cab driver was beneath me. Keep in mind now that him hacking every night and weekends put me through two private schools. I had a brand new car at 18 or 19. I had a color TV at 10 years old. See, y'all don't know about having a color TV at 10. Y'all young people, y'all don't know. So y'all got all kinds of phones and tablets now. They have a color TV and a private number in your room. At 10. It was huge. I was shopping at Lord and & Taylor and Garfinkel's before the age of 15, for those of us who know about Lord and & Taylor and Garfinkel's. But I thought that the money that this man was earning so I could do all these things was beneath me. See, I was measuring my father's success by my ruler which, by the way, at the age of whatever, I had no ruler, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous. And what I find us doing, we, we tend to measure someone else's success with our ruler. Oh, you know what? You should do more than just be, just be a bus driver. You should be more than just a trash collector. I thank God for our trash collectors. I'm telling you, I to think that you're going to pick up somebody else's trash, the things that are waste, and they're going to come through to keep our neighborhood clean? Thank you, Jesus. How dare us measure somebody else based upon what we think they should be doing? And you know what? My father was happy being a cab driver. 
That's what he wanted to be. And out of that, guess what? He taught me how to serve. So I'm actually living in his legacy now because I'll take anybody anywhere at any time of the day. If you're going to the airport at 3 o'clock in the morning, call your pastor. Seriously. There, there are people in this room. I will roll up at your house at 3 o'clock. Yes, um, mill houses, that's true. You know, it, you know it to be true. Don't care. But we have to stop this empty glory, making us think that we're better than other people. We're not better than anybody. And I... A 10-year-old boy certainly isn't better than his father who's providing for the 10-year-old boy. That shows you that was a child. That makes no sense. So children, if you think, you know, because you may know how to figure out something on your tablet faster than your parents, the fact that you have a tablet, hush your mouth. Yeah, you might know that new math or that boy math or girl math as they call it. Shut up. You couldn't afford the book without your parent. You know, just because we don't know the latest sling or, or slang or logo or, or uh, slangs or whatever you call it, I can't even say it anymore because I'm so saved now. <laughs> That's a lie. But we got to get past this, oh, I'm embarrassed about my, about my parents. Thank God for my parents. Thank God for the Cadillac and the cab. To some of us, even as adults, we got a little too cute. My parents were from Kinston, North Carolina. Uh, Minister Webb and Minister Morehouse, I'm, I'm Reverend Mil Milhouse, know what that, what that is. <laughs> we went down in April. If you blink, you're going to be through it. Don't blink, I'm trying to tell you. Just as humble of a beginning as can be. But out of Kinston, North Carolina, came a cab driver and a woman who went to Juilliard, Howard, and all kinds of great stuff. Great things come out of Kinston. Don't you dare ever measure someone else's success by what you think they should be doing. When I say that we're to be humble, we must be lowly in mind. We have to be lowly in mind. You know what that means? Humiliation of the mind or modest. Humiliation of the mind or modest. Over in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, you don't have to turn there, the word of God says that don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think soberly. But see, here's what we have to be careful because some of us will hear to be lowly in mind. See, some of us are too low in our mind. So here's what we have to do. We have to say this to ourselves. We are not better than anyone, and we're not worse than anyone. We're not better than anyone, Mike White, and we're not worse, fill in the blank, than anyone. See, church, it's Jesus and the rest of us. We're to compare ourselves to Jesus. That's it. See, we have to let nothing be done through strife of vainglory. We have to be lowly in mind. And church, to be humble, we have to esteem others better than ourselves. We have to esteem others better than ourselves. What I mean by that, church, treat others with a high regard. Treat others with a high regard. In other words, we cannot be respecter of persons. See, God can be respecter of persons. We cannot be respecter of persons. You know, we had new members of orientation yesterday. And my wife and I showed up at 9.24 a.m. New members orientation didn't start until 10. You know why I got there early for new members orientation? Because if I were meeting with Bishop at 10, I would get here before 9.30. And I can't 
let my enthusiasm for meeting with my authority be above me meeting with my members. And some of us, we adjust our schedules based upon who we're meeting with. If someone has blessed you with blessing you with their time, show up early. I don't care who you're meeting with. If it's a teacher to a student, if it's a student to a teacher, show up early. If you decide to say, well, oh, I'm only meeting with so-and-so, I'll get there when I get there, versus, oh, I'm meeting with pastor, let me get there early, you've now placed me above God. You've said that I'm more important than the other person. And I just told you, it's Jesus and the rest of us. We have to esteem others better than ourselves. We should be treating everyone in high regard. If you see someone dressed differently than you're dressed, or the way you don't like to be dressed, but you see how they're dressed, and you might think that that's not the proper way to dress, still treat them with high regard. One of the things I love to do is when I see somebody who's not dressed the way I think they should be dressed, but I treat them like I want them to be dressed, they actually step up. I see them pick up their shoulders and hold their head a little bit. Instead of saying, hey, bro, how you feel? Hey, sir, excuse me, I need your help. Because everyone else who sees them, you know, stocking the shelves at the food line, goes, yo, bro, can you hand me that? Versus, hey, sir, I need your assistance. They change how they greet and how they connect with you. I was at, uh, we were getting food last night, and just me speaking to people and how I was engaging with the people who were serving me, they, I ended up having four people talking to me all at the same time. And all I did was I, I just spoke. And I probably teased and Joan and did a little bit of stuff like, like I normally do. I said, hey, how are you? And people are like, oh, I'm doing well. How are you, sir? And they all kind of gathered around. I said, well, can you get to my food too, though? But we have to esteem others better than ourselves. And then church, fourthly, to humble ourselves, we have to take our attention off of ourselves. We have to take our attention off of ourselves and place it on someone else. We have to take our attention off of ourselves. And more than likely, we will go there next week. But Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane did just that. He took his attention off of himself. He said, Father, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. But then he said, he said within himself, Jesus, Emmanuel, take your attention off of yourself. Then he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but Father, let your will be done. So those are the four ways, right, that we can humble ourselves. And see, Jesus is the epitome of not letting anything be done through strife and vainglory, to be lowly in mind, to esteeming others better than himself, to take the attention off of himself and put on others, right? Listen to this, church. From birth to death, Jesus, the creator of all things, who was before all things, who was the head of the church and the body, the preeminent one, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Guess what he did? He humbled himself. So if we want to look into Jesus, right, how did Jesus humble himself? The first way Jesus humbled himself, you ready for this? It's so simple this morning. Jesus humbled himself by being conceived and born. Jesus humbled himself by being conceived and born. Church, Jesus didn't ha- did not have to be born. Jesus could have just appeared. He is my favorite, now my favorite description of Jesus is he is the beginning. The beginning could have said, okay, I need to redeem man back into myself. I'm just going to come down with a legion of angels and then 
touch man's heart, and then go back up. He is the beginning. But church, he chose to come in the form of a man and to start out by being conceived and born as a baby. How humble can you be if you're the one who created everything and said, I'm going to come down and redeem man back into the Father, but I'm going to come as a baby, an infant. I want to be, I want to travel the exact same way man traveled. I want to be touched, have compassion with the infirmities of everything that's going on with him without being, uh, uh, without sinning, but I want to come the very way in which man comes. Listen to this. As a baby, babies are vulnerable. Think about that. A child, a brand new baby, they are vulnerable. They're exposed to everything. They can't protect themselves from anything. They can't fend for themselves in any way. Babies completely depend on others for survival. Literally. Babies are breastfed so they can live. Think back before all the technology, technology that we have, the only way a baby could be nursed is to be nursed. And listen to this. With the exception of crying and pooping, babies have to be taught everything. And Jesus Christ the righteous, the preeminent one, the creator of everything, said, I want to come as a vulnerable baby. He's God. And he chose to come as a child. Now go back and listen to all the songs we played and ministered during service. Because you know what, church? We have to stop celebrating Advent season just in December. We have to thank God for Jesus' birth. Not for the fact that he came out, for the fact that he came out that way. That he didn't have to be born. See, that's what God wants us to celebrate all the other 11 months of the year. Celebrate the fact that Jesus didn't have to be born as a baby. Yes, we're going to celebrate the fact that he was born as a baby in December, but from January through November, let's celebrate the fact that he didn't have to come that way. More than likely, I'm not going to read any scripture. I, got all, I gave you a whole bunch of scripture. Matter of fact, over in Matthew chapter 1, it talks about the fact that Jesus was born um, by the, um, or being conceived by the Holy Ghost, and he was born the Virgin Mary, right? And that they, they actually named him, Gabriel named him Jesus before he got here. Jesus had a name. And it was Emmanuel, God being with us. But then when you go over to Luke chapter 1, and you have to go there because I'm going to be all over the place today. I can see that right now. I love this. When it talks about Jesus being born, he was born in a manger. You know what a manger is? It's a trough where the horses and the other animals came to eat. Jesus said, What's the most humble way in which I can come? First, I'm going, to be, I'm going to come down as a vulnerable baby, but then I'm going to tell my mother to wrap me in swaddling clothes and lay me in a trough where the animals spit and take up water. But then they said that when you read a little bit further in Luke chapter 2, there was no room at the end. Jesus is the beginning and the end, right? There was no room in the end for the end. Jesus is the beginning and the end. There was no room in the end for the end. Jesus could have snapped his fingers, and there could have been all kinds of room at the end. But he says, you know what, Father? Never mind. I know that I'm the end, but there's no room for me. I like it this way. It humbles me. Yeah. 
Listen to this, church. Talking about the fact that Jesus was born unto a woman that he created. He was born unto a woman that was created. Mary delivered her deliverance. Mary delivered her deliverance. Listen to this way, church. What was inside her belly will one day be inside her heart. And he chose to have it that way. He said, I want to come just like man, but I can't be born into sin because you can't redeem man from sin and back into the Father by being born in sin. So I'm, I'm going to have myself conceive myself in the sight of this virgin woman so I can be born as a man who can be touched with the infirmities of every part of man and, but not have sinned. See, I, I can't be born that way because Adam ruined it because I created Adam too. But I'm going to come another way. I'm going to conceive myself. Just the fact that Jesus conceived himself and still chose to come as a vulnerable baby to let you know right there we can be humble. That's in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 21. I'll give them to you again. I'll give them to you for homework, but you can write them down again. Matthew 1, 18 through 25, and Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 21. But guess what? That wasn't the only way in which Jesus humbled himself. I said from birth to death, he humbled himself. In addition to being born, Jesus humbled himself by being subject to his parents. Over in Luke chapter 20, uh, Luke chapter 2, excuse me, over in verse 42 to 40, 41 to uh, 52, it talks about the fact that um, his parents now were back in Jerusalem, and they were going there for the feast and the Passover. And after fellowshipping there for a number of days, as they were making their way back, they left Jesus. You know, they were with a crowd of people, right? They said, who got Jesus? You know, when you got a little small child, you just say, who, who got the baby? Who got the baby? Well, come to find out, they had gone three days' journey without Jesus. Three days. That alone. Think about that. Jesus, who's the beginning was left as a child for three days without his parents. And so they found him in the temple, actually teaching and, and, and expounding on the word, because he is the word, by the way. And they were amazed at what was happening. And his mother said, boy, why would you do this to your father and your mother? He said, mom, don't you know that I'm about my father's business? Not Joseph's business, but my father in heaven's business. Look down at verse 51 of Luke chapter 2. And it says, He, being Jesus, went down with them, his parents, and came to Nazareth. How about this? And was subject unto them. Jesus went down with them, his parents, and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. You know what that means? He did what his parents told him to do. The beginning, the everlasting father obeyed his parents and did what he was told to do. The, the two people that he created, he said, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, I will do what you have to do because I've come down to humble myself. And I can't be Lord and Savior without humbling myself first. But you know, my favorite way in which Jesus humbled himself? It's actually not even written in the Bible. The third way, if you will, that Jesus humbled himself, he had nothing written about him for 18 years. Jesus humbled himself. The word had nothing written about him for 18 years. I will have you read this because I want you to see this. We're in Luke 2, right? 
Look at verse 42. <coughs> Excuse me. And when he, he being Jesus, was 12, 12 years old, they came up or went up to Jerusalem after the custom of feast, right? So it gives you his age of 12, right? Go with me over to Luke chapter 23. Just flip a page over. And Jesus himself began to be about what? 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. From 12 to 30, nothing is written about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember now, if you go over it, you have to turn there, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Word of God says, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, the inspiration of Jesus. So how is it that Jesus, who inspired man to write him, him being the Word of God, down, he said, leave out half of my, my years. I'm only going to live to be 30, 33. Believe out 18 years of my life. How humble can you be? The word who's inspiring man to write the word says, don't write anything about me for 18 years. So my autobiography is missing 18 years of data, of history. Now, that's humble. That's humility. When you have the chance to write something about yourself, you're actually, it's like me telling you to write a biography about me then I say, leave out everything before sin, everything before Christ. That's not, it's not even worthy, not even necessary. How humble of that could, could be? Because I wouldn't want everybody to know everything about me if I was writing the book. But I'm telling people to write about me and to leave out half of my age, half of my years. That's humble. That's amazing to me that he inspired men of old to write about him, and he said, don't write about me. And the whole book's about him. But when it comes to my life, those 18 years are irrelevant. Don't even put them in there. I was a child, now I'm an adult. And the last way in which Jesus humbled himself, and he humbled himself in many a ways, but this is what God gave me. Jesus humbled himself by being lied on, tried, and crucified. How about this? By man who he created. If I hadn't run my mouth so much today, I'd have you read, we would read Mark 15, <laughs> uh, verses 1 through uh, 33 or even 38, actually, is what I gave you for homework. But church, Jesus humbled himself by being lied on, by being tried and crucified unjustly by man who he created. Can you imagine, as he was going before Pontius Pilate, he's got to be thinking to himself, Pontius, I knew you before your mom and your daddy knew each other. Here I am having to come to submit, to submit myself to you, to prove to you that I am who I say I am. And then after you were too much of a punk to go ahead and let me free, you actually let Barabbas go, who was a murderer, because of the people were going to tell on, uh, tell, tell on you to um, um, Caesar. You then had people plant a, a, a crown of thorns and place it on my head. You had people spit on me, mock me threaten me, beat me, draw nails into my hands. And I'm thinking around, the very wood they nailing me on, I created that. You couldn't even crucify me without me. The very wood that you actually propping up, the very wood that you have me carry right now, I've carried before. I spoke the wood into existence. But I'm going, to go, I'm going to go ahead and carry my own cross because you know what? I'm so humble. I'm coming here to serve, and I got to get down and get under this cross and carry this cross up to Golgotha, the hill of the skull. 
and as you spit on me, the saliva that comes out of your mouth, I put in your mouth. But yet, I'm going to stay still. And even when the thieves on the cross, one of which are railing against me, I show mercy on him, even though I created him. He deserves to be up here. And when the other said, hush to the other thief and ask Jesus to remember him as he enters into his kingdom, Jesus was so humble as he went down to hell to grab those who had died in faith, having not seen the promise, and he was making that great glorious train back up to heaven. He stopped. He had enough humility to stop and remember that thief who was supposed to die, who would deserve to die. But because now Jesus had come to redeem man, no one deserves to die. All because Jesus is humble. So the next time you find yourself, or I find myself a little too high and mighty, or as my mother would say, a little too big for your britches, remember that Jesus humbled himself and came down as a baby. He was subject to his parents. He didn't have anything written about him for 18 years, over half his life. And that church, Jesus was so humble that he was unjustly lied on, tried, and crucified by the very people that he actually created. Today, is there somebody who has enough humility to give their lives to Christ the one who was humble enough to give you life. Is there anyone present in the room right now that does not know Jesus Christ, the humble one, as their Lord and Savior? If so, raise your hand. I'm going to take my time. I know all the faces are familiar, but see, your heart might not be familiar to God. You might not know him like you think you know him. If there's someone present who needs to give their life to Christ or rededicate their life to Christ, raise your hand. Good. Now let's pray for someone out there who might be where we were at one time because we can't measure their success by our ruler. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we confess with our mouth our Lord Jesus, and we believe, Father, that you raised Jesus from the dead. Today I'm saved, I'm changed to be unchangeable. Thank you, Father. I praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.